Uh, are y'all ready for the word? Did y'all miss me as much as I miss y'all? I hope, I hope y'all don't get sick of me. I really hope you don't get sick of me. It is the highest honor and the highest privilege to be able to share uh, the word of God with you every single Sunday. I know I've been gone a minute, but I'm back today and uh, I got a word. I got a word. I got a word. And I feel like it's going to bless you. It's going to bless you. So go with me to the book of Acts today. Acts chapter 20. Acts chapter 20. And I want to look at verses 7 through 12. While you're looking for Acts or getting ready to look on the screen, could I see your hand one last time? And this is your first time here. Can I see your hand again? First time here. Come on. Hey, I'm glad you're here. How many of you, this is your first time ever in church? Can I see your hand? Yeah, they already left. They're like, these people are crazy. <laughs> oh, yeah, we are. We are. Acts chapter 20. I just feel like you turn up everywhere else. How come I can't turn up in church? Why not? Why not? Acts chapter 20, starting at verse number 7. We'll go down to verse number 12. When you're ready to read it, say, yeah. yeah. Need a little time to find it. Say, give me a minute. Come on. It says, on the first day of the week, we came together to break bread. And Paul spoke to the people, and because he intended to leave the next day, he kept on talking until midnight. And there were many lamps in the upstairs room where we were meeting. And seated in a window was a young man named Eutychus, who was sinking into a deep sleep as Paul talked on and on. It's a long sermon. And when he was sound asleep, he fell to the ground from the third story and was picked up dead. Paul went down, threw himself on the young man and put his arms around him. Don't be alarmed, he said. Ooh, only a man of faith could be looking at a corpse, talking about, it's all right. <laughs> Don't be alarmed. He said, uh, he's alive. Then he went upstairs again and broke bread and ate and kept on preaching. This is the longest recorded sermon in the Bible. I was doing the math while the Sundays was off. I actually could preach till about midnight tonight just from the Sundays that I missed. How many of y'all would stick around? You lying. You leave early before I dismiss. Stop. Stop. <laughs> and it says the people took the young man home alive and were greatly comforted. Can you say amen? amen? What an unusual passage of scripture. I, I am intrigued with this dude named Eutychus who made the Bible, got his name in the Bible. Eutychus did. Not for what he said. We have no clue what Eutychus ever said. All we know about him is that he fell asleep in church, <laughs> fell out the window, died, <laughs> and then got resurrected. That's all we know. But I got a feeling that if Eutychus was resurrected again, and he could say something to us, he would say the title of my message today. He would just simply look at us and say, I didn't know I fell asleep. I didn't know I fell asleep. Look at your neighbor for the last time. Probably not the last time, but indulge me. Look at your neighbor one more time and say, neighbor, I didn't know I fell asleep. Look at your other neighbor, your second option. Look at them right in their face. Say, other neighbor, this would be a terrible message for you to sleep in. Come on, if you know God's going to speak in the second service, give him some praise. While you're clapping, help me thank God, not just for the social Dallas global family. Help me thank God for all the inmates that are watching this right now on the Pando app. All of our brothers and sisters, we see you. Lord, speak to us today. Amen. You can sit down. Go to sleep if you want. I didn't know. Didn't know I fell asleep. Social fam, this text today triggered for me a memory that occurred during Taylor and I's first year of marriage. Something that I will never, ever forget. Uh, some of you know that before we planted this church two years ago that I was 
an evangelist and had an itinerant ministry. And I would travel from city to city, uh, from place to place, preaching from Genesis all the way to the maps in the back. I did that for 16 years, traveling and preaching. I'll never forget, it was our first year of marriage, and this was a crazy week of ministry. I think I was in a different city every single week. It was scheduled to be in a different city. And here I got my new bride with me, and I was excited for her to go with me because I was going to show her. It's real in these ministry streets. You're going to see what it's like to live out of a suitcase, go from city to city and preach. She was like, I can handle it. Let's go. I'm excited. I said, okay, you're going to see. We preached in a different city every week. I'll never forget it culminated with a Sunday morning service. It was in Middleothian, Virginia. Shout out Middleothian, Virginia. That was a church we were at. And I'll never forget it because we got in late Saturday night, and the pastor said we got three Sunday morning services. And the first one starts at 8 a.m. So I looked at my bride, and I said, my, my, my new bride. And I said, hey, you don't have to come to all three, okay? It's a lot. We've been traveling a lot. Why don't you come to the second or maybe come to the third? Now, keep in mind, this is the first year of marriage, okay? If it was like today, now, come on, we're about to celebrate 11 years in a few weeks. So... Got double digits on the board. So if it was today, you know, her reply would be like, uh, duh, I wouldn't come in all three anyway. I'll catch you at the last one <laughs> or maybe at lunch. But when you're at Newlywed, it's just different. She's like, oh, my goodness, no. I would never miss a service. I'm going to be at all three. I got you. I want to support you. We can't be separated. We have to stay connected. I said, okay, all right. It's going to be an early morning. So we get up, we go to this first service, and I'm preaching there. I will never forget it. I'm preaching with everything I got. And I'm about two-thirds of my message, I'm about to land the plane. And as I'm preaching, I notice in my peripheral, my bride, who is on the front row of the church, has her eyes closed. <laughs> and I'm telling immediately, my initial thought was this. I was like, see, I picked the right one. She is praying for her man. <laughs> Look at that. I got a woman of prayer. She is interceding. She knows that this is the most important part of the entire message, that people are about to respond to the gospel, and she's already preparing the atmosphere with intercessory prayer. I said, this is powerful. I picked the right one. Kept on preaching. All of a sudden, I noticed she wasn't just praying, but her, her head was rocking. I said, hold on. We Pentecostal. We ain't that Pentecostal. Why? Why is her head rocking? I kid you not. I'm telling the truth. And before you know it, she has her head all the way back, passed out, and then mouth <laughs> wide open on the front row while I'm preaching. I panicked. I panicked. I kept on preaching. But then I started noticing that everybody in the service, it wasn't that big of a church, everybody is noticing her fall asleep in the service y'all I just landed the plane real quick I said worship team come on out everybody stand I said everybody stand then she woke up and stood up and oh it was awkward in the green room afterwards because we were smiling there was all kinds of niceties and as soon as the pastor left I said babe are you serious on the front row you didn't notice everybody noticing you sleeping and she said what every person who has fallen asleep said I couldn't help it I, I didn't know I didn't know I fell asleep. Come on, let's be honest today. It has happened to the best of us. It is, I don't care who you are. I promise you there has been a Sunday ooh, where you have dozed a little bit. Some of you I know because I see you. I see you from up here. You don't realize that. I see you. Every single one of us has had a Sunday where we've dozed off. It will get the best of us. I don't care how much faith you got. I caught my dad a couple of Sundays ago falling asleep, falling asleep in church. He's the most spiritual man I know. In fact, I wanted to put the picture of it in this service to show you him falling asleep. And I asked him, I said, Dad, can I put up your picture of you falling asleep that mom got in the service? He said, absolutely not. Over my dead body will you put that picture up. <laughs> Welcome to my Nigerian dad life. But it's gotten the best of us. All of us have had a Sunday where we have fallen asleep. The intent and the assignment of this message is not to shame those of you who have fallen asleep in service. As a matter of fact, if you're watching this message in Pando app at home or in the room and you've never had a Sunday, you ain't never had a Sunday that you've dozed off, what you're actually telling me is you don't go to church a lot. Because <laughs> I promise you there's going to be a Sunday where you just start to doze a little bit. So I'm not here to shame those of you who've fallen asleep in church. I guess what I'm trying to do today is ask what I've been asking of this text the entire week. Why is this story in the Bible? 
Why in the world, of all the stories that the physician, Dr. Luke, when he put pen to parchment to talk about the history of the early church, why is this story of Paul preaching and Eutychus sleeping, why did this one make the Bible? Come on, Dr. Luke. Of all the stories you could have talked about, why would you put this story in the Bible? Understand that the book of Acts is uh, chronicling the first 30 years of the history of the church. It's letting you know that what God said came to pass when he said that you would be my witnesses to Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. I love the book of Acts because you get to watch and read almost in living color to see what began in an upper room with 120 people in Jerusalem ended up going all the way to Rome. How is that? That a gospel and an experience that started in the upper room with 120 people all of a sudden proliferated and went all the way to to Rome. That's why I don't despise small beginnings. Oh, I'm telling you, if the Holy Spirit is on that thing, you can watch God take small beginnings and take small beginnings around the world. And to think that the gospel that was preached back then is still being declared around the world today. Oh, I don't understand though. Luke, why would you write this story about Paul and Eutychus falling asleep? Why did this make the book? We're just getting snapshots in the book of Acts. Why do we get this story? I get why you wrote about Paul and Ananias. Oh, I understand that interaction. That's a good story to conclude, to include. Because you remember, Paul is the artist formerly known as Saul. He was the one that was actually killing Christians. He was on his way on Damascus to kill more Christians. And all of a sudden, a bright light shined out of nowhere and knocked Paul off of his high horse and a voice came from the light and said, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And look at what he said back. Who are you, Lord? He knew that the power was not ordinary. I love that. I love that you're not too big for God to bring you down to your knees. I love that I don't care what you've done or where you've been. You are not beyond the reach or the grace of God. Only God could take a murderer and turn him into a church planter. He's still doing miracles like that today. Be careful who you write off. Be careful who you say, oh, God can't use them. God has the power because of his grace to turn people around. And he blinded Paul. Ooh. Only God will blind you so you can actually see. And here's Paul looking for Ananias. And Ananias, who was probably scared at first that he was going to get killed, lays hands on him so he can see. I get Paul and Ananias. I get Paul and Barnabas. I get why you write about that, Dr. Luke. You need Paul and Barnabas. I love that it was good to the early church and to the Holy Spirit to send not just Paul by himself on a missionary journey, but he needed a companion. He needed Barnabas to go with him. So away with this notion that God's going to call you to do something by yourself. Anytime God is going to do something in you and through you, it will always be bigger than you. And you need to start asking yourself, God, don't just give me the power. Give me the partner. Connect me with the person that's going to bring this promise into pass. So I, I get Paul and Barnabas. I get Paul and Silas. Come on, y'all. What would a watch night service look like if we didn't have Paul and Silas in a prison at midnight praising God? Isn't that crazy how you can do the right thing and still end up in the wrong place? And there they are praising God at midnight. I get Paul and Silas because how many you know when life has put you in a dungeon and you've been whipped and beaten, it feels a lot better when you got somebody with you praise. Come on, don't make me praise by myself. That's why you ought to do a road check when you come to church. I don't want people on my road that when I'm lifting up my hands, you suck your teeth and rolling your eyes. I want people in the room that when I say highlight, they say hallelujah. When I say praise God, they say Lord. It feels better when there's an atmosphere that comes together in agreement to praise God. I get Paul and Silas. I get Paul and Silas. I get, I get Paul and P Publius. You remember Paul, Paul and Publius? You remember them? Remember when Paul got off a shipwreck and got bit by a snake and he healed his father, that governor's father? Isn't that crazy that the same hand that he got bit by a snake is the same hand that he laid hands on his dad and healed him? Oh, be careful because God will use some wounded healers. Sometimes it's when you've been through some stuff that you got the power to speak to some stuff. Lay hands on people. I get Paul and Publius. But I don't get Paul and Eutychus. Why do we need to know about Paul preaching and this young dude sleeping? Surely the message is not don't sleep in church. That can't be the message. I mean, come on. Matter of fact, I got to the place in my preaching. If you sleep on me, get your rest. <laughs> I'm secure enough in my communication. <laughs> you can go to sleep. Surely that's not the message. And surely the message is not preach shorter sermons. 
Oh, I hope not. Because Paul was preaching a long time. And I've seen people even use this text to suggest that preachers should preach shorter. I had a seminary professor that said that the mind cannot retain what the seed cannot endure. So he said, you ought to preach a little cute, short messages. And I guess that works in some context. My problem with that, if you're going to put that on this text, uh, how come Eutychus was the only one that fell asleep? The, people that, the Bible doesn't tell us how many people were in that upper room. But of all the people that were in there, let's say there was 100, Eutychus is one out of the 99 that's dozing off. Oh, you can't put this on Paul preaching long because although Eutychus fell asleep, nobody else fell asleep. Otherwise, you know Dr. Luke, he's thorough. He would have said everybody in there fell asleep. Eutychus just happened to be the one that fell out the window. So it's not that it was Paul preaching too long. As a matter of fact, that lets me know the atmosphere of expectation that was in the room. Because although Eutychus fell asleep, everybody else in the room had no problem with Paul preaching that long. Everybody else in the room was sitting on the edge of their seat saying, Paul, if you got the depth of content, we've got the depth of capacity to receive it. Oh, can I just pause right there and say sometimes the issue is not the person that's pouring out. Sometimes the issue is the capacity of the person that's sitting there to receive. Eutychus went to sleep, but shout out to the other believers that were in that room that said, Paul, if you got more content, we got more capacity. We can be here all night. We ain't got nothing else to do. We came with expectation to receive something. Oh, I don't hear nobody. I must have got a whole lot of Eutychuses in here. But there must be some people in here that said, if you got something to pour out, I came prepared. My capacity is ready to receive what you got. Yeah. Look at Paul. Paul had the depth of content to pour out to the depth of capacity to the people that were in the room. That is a powerful principle to understand because many of us are crying out to God, saying, God, give me more. And God's saying, I got a whole lot to give. I got oceans to pour out. Problem is, you coming to me with a little saucer. And so you're complaining about what you want me to pour out. But I'm trying to check your capacity to see if you're ready to get what I want to uh, give you. Oh, I had a TV show flashback. I had a TV show flashback. Some of y'all are too young to remember this commercial. You remember this commercial? It was for hot dogs, and they had this powerful phrase in the commercial. It still preaches. It had this one line. It said, hunger gets what hunger wants. You remember that? You know, some of y'all now. Okay, you too young. It was for a hot dog. It was the weirdest commercial because they'd just be sitting in the commercial, and all of a sudden a hand would come out the person's stomach, and they grab the hot dog, and just they eat the hot dog, and they just end the commercial saying, hunger gets what hunger wants. Oh, that thing will preach right there. Because can I tell you, sometimes it's not the preacher, it's you. Sometimes it's not the church, it's you. But I wonder if there's anybody's spirit that says, oh, hunger gets what hunger wants. If you got something you're going to pour out, I'm ready to receive. I'm not here to fulfill a religious duty. I came expecting to get a breakthrough. I came expecting to get a word from God. And if you got expectation, God will always meet you at the level of your expectation. Oh, I need a 20 second praise break for those that got some expectation. Patient. I'm expecting him to do something. I got capacity to receive. <laughs> What's your capacity? What's your capacity? Paul had enough preaching to pour out. And the believers at Troas had enough capacity to receive. Ooh, if I could go back in time, I would preach in that upper room in Troas. I wouldn't look at Eutychus, but I would look at the rest of them and say, oh, y'all ready for the word? And I'll pour out. And there Paul is preaching to a room filled with expectation. Expectation. Matter of fact, I think that if you're expecting something, preparation is a sign of your expectation. See, a lot of people are expecting things, but they don't have what I call proof of expectation. Some of y'all, I'm expecting God to do something. Really? Prove it. It's all, I used to shout when people just say, I'm expecting big things. Now I'll go, let me see the receipts. <laughs> let me see your proof of expectation. Because people today are crazy. I'm expecting to get a house. Okay. You tithing? No, but I'm expecting <laughs> to get a house. <laughs> oh, okay. I think you, all right. Have, are you saving? I, no, but I'm expecting <laughs> to get a house. I, have you downloaded Zillow? No, I don't know what that is, but I'm expecting <laughs> Expectation is not enough. I want to know your proof 
of your expectation. Well, I'm expecting God to send me around the world and preach. Okay, you, you got a passport? No. But I got expectation. Because interesting, when I studied the Gospels, almost every person that got a miracle from Jesus, they had proof of expectation. Remember the woman with the issue of blood? She pressed her way through a crowd. Understand, she is breaking every law. She is unclean. She's not supposed to be in public. But her pushing and breaking protocol is what? Proof of expectation. No wonder he stopped in the middle of the crowd and said, somebody touched me. And the disciples said, you crazy. Everybody touching you. Say, no, they touching me, but they're not touching me with proof of expectation. There is a woman that's got proof of expectation. And I'm not taking another step till I see her. It's proof. Proof of expectation. Remember the friends that had the lame dude that they wanted to get healed and there was a big old crowd crowded like it is in here today and they didn't think that the crowd was to stop them from their friend getting a breakthrough? No, they went upside the house to a hole in the roof. You know what they were doing? They were saying, I got proof of expectation. Tearing the roof is on me. Healing his legs is on Jesus. But I'm showing you my proof. I feel like preaching. Can I preach like I've been out of my pulpit for a while? You better have some proof of expectation. I ain't got the job, but I got the suit. Proof of expectation. I ain't got the credit score, but I'm still looking. Proof of expectation. I ain't got the church building yet, but I'm still looking on every single app saying, God, just open up a building big enough. I got to have some proof. Expectation. You expect it? Prove it. Prove it. So, so this room, this room had proof of expectation. How do you know, Pastor Robert? Give us scripture. I'm so glad you asked. It was in the text right there. I think it's verse number eight. Yeah. <laughs> See, y'all read past that. Got to read the Bible slow. There were many lamps in the upstairs room where they were meeting. Paul ended up preaching till midnight. I don't think it was his intent to preach till midnight. But when you got a room full of expectation, things are happening. He ended up preaching till midnight, but it just so happened that the room was already prepared. Not with one lamp. Put it back up there. How many? Many lamps. Do you realize that means before Paul walked up the stairs to preach, somebody went in that room and said, get a bunch of lamps. Because you know how Paul is. And we might be here all night. And I'm not about to have this man of God preaching in the dark. He's about to write the Bible. Put as many lamps out. That's proof. Of expectation, there is no electricity. All they had was a bunch of lamps. Oh, come here, Matthew chapter 25. Remember Matthew chapter 25 when Jesus tells a parable? And it's ten bridesmaids, five are wise, five are foolish. And all of them ended up like Eutychus, falling asleep. And when the master, the bridegroom came, all of them had lamps, all of them fell asleep. Oh, wait a minute, but only five, the ones that were wise, had what? Oil. Oil. See, first service, I just shouted about the lamps. But this second service, and God still preaches while I'm still preparing to preach. And I just want to shout that they had some oil too. They didn't just have enough lamps. They had enough oil for the lamps. Because if they just brought lamps that didn't have the oil, they would have been just like those five foolish bridesmaids. But you know you got expectation when you didn't just bring the lamp. Oh, but I got some oil. I got some anointing. I got some stuff that's going to last in the darkness that's around me. Oh, somebody will give God some praise like you brought some oil. I'm not going to settle just for the lamp. I got to be wise in this dark age in which we live. I need some oil. Jesus, I feel like preaching today. Do you have oil? They were prepared. This is proof of expectation. If they were not expecting, it would have started getting dark and then somebody would have had to leave the room and say, oh, wait, let me go get the lamps. Somebody record what Paul's saying. Let me go get the lamps. But no, I prepared beforehand. And so I got an expectation. 
So I want to ask you in a practical sense, are you preparing for a move of God? Are you preparing for what he wants to do in your life? Are you prepared? And if you are, let me see the proof of the expectation. And there they are in an upper room full of lamps and they're listening to Paul preach. I've been gone for a minute, so I have to tell you where I traveled to. I went to this room. I went to this upper room. I went up there. Ooh, it was a powerful experience. I didn't go to Israel, but I went up to that room. I didn't go to Troas, but I went up to this room in my exegetical imagination. I went up there. No, I'm for real. I went up there. Y'all know I'm crazy. I went up there. I stood on the shore of Troas. I smelt the seawater. I was there. I was there. I worked all day as would have been the custom in that time, working all day. But the work seemed to go by fast because I had eager expectation for the meeting that was happening that night. It was powerful because it was the first day of the week. You know, normally they would gather on the Sabbath, the Saturday in the synagogue, but everything changed because Jesus has now risen from the grave. And this is the first recorded meeting on a Sunday. In the Bible, this is the first recorded gathering that they got together on a Sunday Night, I was there, y'all, I was there in the room after working all day, and everybody was excited. The expectation was palpable in the room. I climbed up three flights of stairs. I got all the way up in that room, and all oh, you should have seen it. It was packed with people who, not everybody showered. I could smell the room, and there I was watching all the candles as they flickered. It hadn't quite gotten dark yet, and I was up there in the room. I was there. I was there when they brought out the food to break, and the break and break and just having fellowship and everybody was eating. I was hungry too because I missed my lunch break and I was eating in the upper room. I was eating. I saw even before Paul got there that we broke bread and we had communion and we remembered his body that was broken for us and we remembered his blood that was shared. I was there in the room when Paul walked in and everybody was like, he's here, he's here. And a hush ensued the room as this powerful apostle that we had heard about all he had done. He had just caused a riot in Ephesus and here he is in our midst. And we sat there and I listened to Paul, perhaps the greatest, most profound, prolific thinker and preacher. I listened to Paul preach. I listened to him preach for 30 minutes. I listened to him preach for an hour. I listened to him preach for an hour and 15 minutes. About an hour and a half. I was like, all right, Paul. <laughs> Gonna wrap this thing up. But I listened to him preach for two hours. The more I realized he wasn't gonna keep on going, I just, you know, I had a lot of food. They had food in the room and it was sitting in my stomach, so I just, I just sat down to get comfortable to listen to Paul preach. I listened to him preach for two hours. And 15 minutes, and about that point, I was like, Paul, you got to land this thing, homie. I'm just this, because, you know, the lights are flickering, and it's getting dark, and I just ate food, too. And I'm trying to pay attention to Paul, and at two hours and 30 minutes in, this fool, going to talk about any questions? I said, Paul, are you serious? Don't ask them for questions. And as they're taking questions going on and on, you know how people ask stupid questions you already know the answer to. Come on. And they're asking all these questions. I said, this is my opportunity. I got to go to the bathroom. So I went to the bathroom. I said, oh, you got to wake up. Then I came back in the room. Somebody took my seat. I said, man, that's messed up. So I stood on the wall. But Paul is three hours in this message. And I'm trying, I'm trying to pay attention in this room. But the lights are flickering in my eyes. I'm getting heavy. And I have food in my stomach. And I'm trying to pay attention. And then it's hot. It's hot in this room. And it's, I just need to get a little air. So I just went by the window, started airing out my tunic just to see if I could stop from sweating a little bit. And then if I was airing out my tunic, I said, well, let me go and sit in this in the window seal. And so I'm sitting in the window seal. And Paul is three hours and 35 minutes into this message. I ain't gonna be honest with you. I, just, I got ADD, so I'm listening, but I'm looking out the window too. I'm like, what is going on? This is the longest sermon I have ever heard. When are you gonna land this plane? And I was trying to pay attention to him. And he started looking at me. I was like, oh Lord, now he's staring. I don't want them to say that I was sleeping on Paul. I said, no, no, stay awake, stay awake, stay awake. And I just listened. He just kept talking and talking, Lord, and then I just got, you know, it's crazy, windows, see if you can, I'm just, I'm just oh Lord, four hours in now, oh, he's asking questions again, See, 
I'm showing you the progression. Because my issue with Eutychus is not his sleep. My issue is with his seat. My issue with Eutychus is not that he's sleeping. It's where he is sitting. Why in the world would you sit in an open window of all the places in the room to sit? Why would you sit in an open window? My issue is not with his sleep. It's where he's sitting. That is a dangerous place to sleep. Him, all of us have had some Sundays, if we're honest, if we dozed a little bit and we got a little sick. But why would you position yourself in this seat? I get that sleep over came you. You probably couldn't help that. It was a long day. And plus, it's midnight. You're supposed to be sleeping at midnight. That was just came on you. But how many you know, you choosing to sit in that seat, you choosing to put yourself in that place of danger, that was on you. Why would you sit right here? It's a dangerous place to sit in an open window. I want to talk to some of y'all who are in the church but you got an open window. I want to talk to you. You love Jesus. Oh, you love him. You're in the church. But you're also concerned with what's going on outside. I'm talking to some of y'all who God has spoken to you to cut off the relationship and you cut off the relationship, but they still in your phone because it's just it's an open <laughs> It's open. I, I'm not talking to those of you who are in the church, but you got an open window just in case. Just in case. I love you, Jesus. I'm here. I'm here. Shout out to Eutychus. He's in the church. But some people can be in the church but still have an open window. God, God, I, I'm going to trust you and step out, but God, I got my backup plan just in case I need to escape. And it's a dangerous thing to have one foot in and one foot out. It's a dangerous thing to have an open window. And my question to you is, not as why you're sleeping. My question is, is that a good place to sit? Is that a good place, is that a good place to sit? I, I know you're in the church. But just because you're in the church don't mean everybody in the church is following Jesus. So I want to, is that a good person to hang out with? But I met him at social, so... Is that a good dude today? Because I have seen some dudes do some good fake worship. They will serve while they praying on who they can break their heart next. I'm, I know you. <laughs> I have seen some atheists come to church because they're trying to holler. I, I know you. You because I'm glad you're here. I just want to ask you, is that a good place to sit? Eutychus has an open window and is sitting in a dangerous place and some of you are just like Eutychus and that you haven't fallen yet and you're dozing but I just want to ask you why would you sit there you, you know you got an open window when you're asking questions how far can I go before it's sin how, how, like, like what is cheating exactly <laughs> You know, it's, 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 it's minimal moral relativity. It's just, I just how, how close, rather than saying, God, how much can you use me and how much can your goodness flow through my life? It's, no, how close can I get to the edge? And I just want to say, Eutychus, why? Why would you sit there? It's a dangerous, dangerous place to sit. And there's Eutychus. He's sitting, and he's dozing. You ever been there before? You ever been fighting sleep? I'm talking about naturally. <sighs> no, for real, you ever been there? I'm talking about where it's coming on you strong. You... <sighs> isn't, it isn't, it, isn't it crazy how stupid you look when you're fighting sleep? <laughs> I'm going to give you mine. I'm going to give you mine. When I'm driving, I'm pretty good in church. But when I'm driving down the highway, my wife will attest to this. She gets nervous when I drive. Don't let it be more than a three-hour drive. Something about the drone of the engine and just when it's dark. I mean, when you should see. I, 
I do the dumbest stuff. Ah, da, 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 da. <laughs> I am getting nervous. I get nervous. Some of y'all going to see me when I'm driving. It's a long drive because I do the dumbest stuff. Hit myself in the head. No wonder he came to the window. That's what I do. I open all the windows and the sunroof. Ah, da, 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 just try not to die. While I'm driving, <laughs> turn up the radio, go through every playlist. Then I start listening to stuff I don't even really listen to all the time. So I got my hands up, singing my song. <laughs> I don't even sing. Just trying to stay awake. Since you've been gone. <laughs> you ever been there? Just try, <laughs> try not to crash your car <laughs> on the side of the road coming back. It's real. It overcomes you. Shout out to Eutychus. I've been there. It's just, it's a fight. It's a fight to stay awake. And no wonder Luke, when he pins not just the book of Acts, but his own gospel, in addition to this, he brings up, like the other gospel writers, the moment where the disciples were with Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane, fighting sleep. Remember that moment? <laughs> fighting it with Jesus, the physical Jesus. Took them on a private trip, just y'all three, and here they are. <laughs> He had to wake them up. And he didn't just say wake up, which would have sufficed. He said, be careful. Watch that you don't fall into temptation. Classic Jesus. What does me sleeping have to do with temptation, sir? I'm confused. <laughs> he said, be careful. He says, the spirit is willing, but the flesh is so weak. In other words, when your God and my God, when your Savior and my Savior got ready to articulate the metaphor about the fight between your flesh and your spirit, he said, it's just like those moments when sleep is coming off to you and you are trying your best to stay awake. That is what the fight is between your flesh and your spirit. No wonder Paul when he writes letters to churches, feels the need to tell them about staying alert, being vigilant, because he's letting you know that everything in our current culture is trying to put you to sleep. This culture is not designed to keep you alert, to keep you awake, to keep you leaning to the things of God. No, it is designed to lull you in to sleep. Come on, that's why. Tick tock, tick tock, tick tock, tick tock, tick tock. Lulling you to sleep. That is the fight of our life. Look at what he says in, to the church in Thessalonica. Let's look at it real quick. It's just one of the many verses. He says, you are children of the light and children of the day. We do not belong to the night or to the darkness. So then let us not be like the others who are asleep, but let us be awake and sober. What he said to the church at Thessalonica, he says to the church at Rome. Look at what he says to them in Romans chapter number 13, verse 11 and 12. And do this. Understanding the present time, the hour has already come for you to wake up from your slumber because our salvation is nearer now than when we first believed. The night is nearly over. The day is almost here. So let us put aside the deeds of darkness and put on the armor of light. Peter does the same thing. Look at what Peter says in 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8. He says, be alert and of sober mind. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for somebody that he can devour. Who is he going to devour? The people who are awake? No. The ones who are falling asleep. It hit my heart today. I feel like it was incumbent upon me to let somebody know that even the disciples with the most sincerest of hearts get sleepy. So away with this notion that if you were really saved, you wouldn't be drowsy. Please. Even the disciples with the most sincere of intentions get tired, get sleepy. Come on, can we give Eutychus credit? At least he was in the room. He had good intentions. I wish intentions were enough. Problem is, intention will get you in the room, but your attention will keep you in the room. So it is the trick of the enemy to get you in the space, but to get you to go to sleep. 
I'm telling you, the disciples with the most sincerest of emotions fall asleep. You know why they fell asleep in the Garden of Gethsemane? We read that text and we're so focused on Jesus' sorrow, we missed it. It says that the disciples were sorrowful too. Sometimes sorrow makes you sleepy because you've been through so much, because you've gone through so much pain. And it's like, I, Lord, I want to pray, but I, but I believe for that last year. God, I'm here. I'm here. I'm in church. But you, I've been praying for this family member's deliverance for years, Lord. I'm just, I'm here. But the sorrow can make you sleepy. Luke is the only one to write a peculiar thing in that paramount moment. Do you remember? When the same three he took the Garden of Gethsemane, he took to a mountaintop. When Jesus was transfigured before them, the one time in Scripture where he allowed his deity, the essence of his glory, to come through his physical body, he is on a mountain glowing. And Moses and Elijah show up. Look, I don't have some encounters with God, but Moses and Elijah ain't never showed up. And I've never seen the physical Jesus glowing. But here's my thought process. If I saw that, I would be wide awake. Oh, nothing would put me to sleep. If Jesus starts glowing and it's just me and him on a mountain and people from the Old Testament show up, yo, I am wide awake. Not just wide awake, with my phone, just right here, just trying to record it, saying, whoo, wait till we come off this mountain. These disciples about to be hating on this. Can you believe this? Say something, Moses. <laughs> you would think you would be alert. I miss this. Luke chapter 9, it says Peter and his companions were very sleepy. I bet they were. They just hiked the mountain. But when they became fully awake, they saw his glory in the two men standing beside him. So don't tell me that just because you've been coming to church for years and you know more scriptures than anybody else and you had communion for breakfast, that you've never had a moment where your flesh has overcome your spirit and gotten sleepy. It happens to the best of us. So I want to comfort you with that, but I also want to say this that might scare you. Because my title is I didn't know I fell asleep. And that is the cry of every person who has ever fallen asleep. They didn't know. So in the physical, I don't know when I fell asleep. I'm wondering, is it possible that I could be right on the edge spiritually and I'm about to fall into danger? Could it be possible that the window that I'm sitting in that I think is a window of opportunity is actually the window that is going to be a window of death for me and I'm numb to it because I'm falling asleep? Our physical bodies tell us something in the spirit that you can be falling asleep spiritually not even know it. I made a list of some things, some signs. This isn't an exhaustive list, but I'd like to share it with you if you're wondering, am I getting sleepy? Because in the same way you got signs in the physical, I think there's some signs in the spiritual that you're getting sleepy. I'd love to give it to you. Is that cool? You know you might be getting spiritually sleepy when you have little or no desire to pray. Notice in both of those instances, Jesus is doing what? Praying with his disciples. Tell them to watch and pray. The son of the living God often got up and would withdraw to a solitude place to pray. Prayer is our connection with him. And whenever that desire is starting to dwindle, I know I'm getting sleepy. You know you might be getting spiritually sleepy if you have a loss of appetite for the word of God. The word is food. It feeds you. Have you ever noticed that you eat what you crave and you crave what you eat? You eat what you crave and you crave what you eat. Like if I just start eating crumble cookies like every day, hypothetical, the more crumble cookies I eat, the more crumble cookies I do it. I'm going to eat that nasty kale salad. You start eating it, and it is gross. Nothing tastes good. But then you say, I'm going to do it again. 
you do it again, you do it again. Before you know it, huh? Because you made a decision to eat something different. Look at you on a Friday afternoon. Talking about, hey, go and order that kale for me. Yeah, uh -huh. extra ranch, but go and order that kale. Because <laughs> you eat what you crave and you crave what you eat. Your loss of appetite for the word of God is a sign. You might begin spiritually sleepy if you no longer get convicted of willful sin. Stuff you used to be convicted about, you can just do so easily now. It's a sign you're getting sleepy. You know you're getting sleepy if you desire to be served rather than serving others. Remember when you used to be just so excited? Whatever you want, social, I'm here. Need me to move a chair? Let's go. I'll move it. Remember that? You're just so happy God had done something in your life. Whatever you need, I'm here. Now it's like, they don't even see what I do in this church. I'm sick of this church. They don't ever acknowledge me. I hadn't got the microphone yet. You know you're getting sleepy when you desire to be served rather than serve. You know you're getting sleepy when you're easily offended. You ever notice when you're sleepy, everything agitates you? When you are tired, everything annoys you. Can, can, can y'all stop breathing? <laughs> breathing is getting on my nerves. My bad. <laughs> Every little thing annoys you now. Why? You're sleepy. You know you're getting sleepy. If you're consistently comparing yourself to others, it's a sign. Because you're counting sheep. I don't have what they have. I didn't get the opportunity they got. You know you're getting sleepy when you're spreading or entertaining gossip. That's why some of y'all sleep with your mouth open. <laughs> Same in the spirit. Start gossiping. And if you're not spreading it, you're like, ooh, tell me more. It's a sign that you're off assignment. You're not doing what he's called you to do. You know you're getting sleepy when you isolate yourself from community from the community of faith, community of believers, that's a sign you're getting sleepy, which brings an indictment to this room. Hear me, I'm glad Eutychus is in the room. I'm so glad he's there. I'm so glad that they were ready and had the lamps in the room, excited about it. But I have an indictment against this room. I want to know, why is it that when Eutychus started sitting in that windowsill, and started falling asleep. How come nobody in that upper room said, yo, Eutychus, don't sit there. That's not a good place to sit. How come nobody in that room when he was dozing off said, Eutychus, wake up, wake up. This is getting to the good part. Paul is talking real good right here. How come nobody woke him up? This is why you need a community of faith. This is why the enemy tries to keep you in isolation. Since I don't know when I'm falling asleep, you know what I need? I need somebody that I have enough compassion and authority to tell me, wake up. You are dozing. Wake up. You got too much purpose to be dating them. Wake up. You're about to throw in the towel on the promise you know God gave you. Wake up, and I'm proud to be your alarm clock today to tell somebody God is calling you to more. Wake up. Wake up out of your slumber. Wake up out of your sleep. Wake up out of your apathy. Wake up out of your complacency. Wake up out of the pain of your past. Wake up. I know I can't tell when I'm falling asleep, but I know somebody can tell me when I need to wake up. This is why I need the church. I need somebody to tell me, hey, bro, you drooling. Hey, bro, your head is bobbing back and forth. Somebody that doesn't do it with judgment but actually has compassion. It says, I know you're tired. I've been tired too. I know you've been working all day, man. I've been there too. But come on, man, you got to wake up. You got to wake up, hear this message from the heart of the Father that's telling somebody to wake up today. I need believers. Why didn't anybody wake Eutychus up? My next question is, I wonder when they noticed he fell. Were they so mesmerized by Paul's preaching since nobody woke him up? I wonder when they noticed he fell. Or were they so honed in on the pontificating 
of Paul that they didn't even notice their brother, this young boy, had fallen out of the window. They didn't even notice. And I wonder sometimes, are we so consumed with me, myself, and I and my blessing that we're oblivious to the people that are sitting right next to you in this service that are going through pain? And is anybody going to look past that little plastic, I'm good, to say, no, 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 you're not good. I haven't even seen you in church in a while. Is anybody going to notice that Eutychus is missing? How long did it take for them to realize that he's falling away? Do you know how many people are out there that should be in here, but they're waiting for somebody to even notice that they fell out the window? Sometimes how the church is, sometimes it's not until the drama outside of the four walls happens that it gets our attention to realize, wait a, wait a minute, Eutychus, Eutychus is gone. At some point they noticed, I don't know when, but at some point they noticed. And here's the other thing that broke my heart. It's not the prognosis that came from the bottom that said he was dead. It seems as though from the text, everybody was content to watch from the window. He's fallen out and everybody's on the inside just looking at him. Some of you have been on the other end of that where you've fallen away. And the people of the church are just, what, can you believe that? Well, you shouldn't have been sitting there anyway. Oh, that's what it gets. Got the nerve to be texting other people saying, did you see, did you hear what happened to Eutychus? Most of them sat in the room, but thank God for Paul. Verse number 10 is what changed my life. Verse number 10 is what brought hope to the text because while everybody else seemingly stayed at the top, do you see what it says in verse number 10? Paul went down. Paul went to, I started having church just on the fact that Paul went down. Some preachers would have kept on preaching, but not Paul. Paul said, I got to come down. Y'all can stay in the room if you want, but there comes a time where you got to stop the preacher and come down to where people are. Paul went down and he got ugly and he laid on top of Eutychus and he said, I believe that the same power that raised Christ from the dead can raise you from the dead too. Is there anybody in the church that's not just going to stay in the four walls and preach the gospel, but not afraid to roll up your sleeves and get down with people who everybody else has written off and said the marriage is dead oh don't believe in that person they're dead look at their history their statistic Paul said no he still got life on the inside of him and I'll come to where he is oh I want to thank Paul for coming down he came down three stories to reach him and I came to tell somebody today that that's exactly what your Savior did for you that's what he did for me. I am Eutychus. I am Eutychus. I have every good intention. I want to do the right thing, but sometimes I get distracted. Sometimes I sit in the wrong place. Sometimes I get too close to the edge and I've fallen. And I'm so thankful that when everybody else would have said I'm dead and counted me out, aren't you glad that your Savior, oh, he didn't come down three stories. He did come down through 42 generations and put on human skin. He said, I can't redeem them from heaven. I got to put on human skin and live the life they were supposed to live and die the death that they were supposed to die. Come on, how many are thankful that on the first Sunday where they celebrated the resurrection, they got a real life resurrection. They didn't know Eutychus was going to get up from the grave, but it had to happen to let the church know that he still can resurrect every dead circumstance. I don't care how long it's been there. He can resurrect it. He can resurrect it. There's been a theme over this service. He's more than able. When did you start to believe that it was over? Eutychus, when did you start to believe that it was over for you? I serve a God who will come down to where you are, who's not afraid to get in the dirt with you. And then when everybody else said it's over, he says, no, there's still life in him. There's still life in him. Everybody else says the marriage is done. No. There's still life. Everybody said your family. 
this just runs in your family. God says, no, there's still life in her. I know you've been gone for a while. Some of you, I don't know who this is for. You've been gone from church a long time, but you showed up today. Why? Because God says you're not dead. There is still life in you. But you got to wake up. You got to wake up. You've been looking for a sign. Here it is. This is your wake-up call because you've been asleep. You didn't even know it. I'm going to ask every person that can to stand to your feet. I'm going to ask everybody to respect this moment. Nobody leaving, I believe. This is not a cute message. This is a word for our church. God's calling us to go deeper. That's our word this year. But some of us have fallen into a deep sleep. And I'm not here to debate the reason why. Some of you, it's just sorrow. It's pain. And my heart empathizes with that. But nevertheless, even though the sorrow has lulled you to sleep, you still got to wake up. Got to wake up. I'm talking to some father. God's calling you to wake up. Your son, your daughter is looking at, at you. Your wife is waiting for the man that will wake up. I'm talking to some mother who's got to wake up. Somebody who's been in a dangerous place and maybe you've gotten in that relationship because you were lonely and you just wanted somebody to love you and you know that it's a dangerous place to sit and God's saying, wake up, get off the ledge. Don't sit in that open window. I didn't know I fell asleep. I didn't know. This is your wake up call today to wake up. Up. Wake up out of apathy. God wants to bring you back to that place where you used to worship and not look at the clock. Where you used to talk to him. He's calling you back to that place. But you got to wake up. Come back to your first love. You're in this place today with not worrying what anybody thinks of you. You say, hey, Pastor Robert, I know this is for me. I, I've got an area that I need to wake up. Maybe you say, I'm, I'm in the room, but I'm going through the motions. I'm sitting in the wrong seat. You're on the edge. But you know this message is a wake-up call for you. If that's you, would you just lift up your hand high enough, long enough as a sign to say, God, I hear you. I hear you. I hear you. Wow. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, God. Lord, wake us up. Wake us up, God. We've fallen asleep. We don't want to fall down. Wake us up. Wake up the church, Jesus. Wake up the church. Wake me up, God. Wake me up. Lord, don't ever let me be content to just have service. <laughs> God, wake me up. I come back to my first love. And just... If you know you need to wake up and this is your wake-up call and you lifted up your hand or you should have, I know it's a lot of people, but... I just think it's worth it today. Would you just get out of your seat and just come find a place at this altar. Get as close as you can. Maybe you can only make it to the aisle. That's fine. I just want you to leave your seat where you are because I want you to physically move to say, God, I'm, I'm, I'm tired of being in this lull of apathy. I'm tired of being lethargic. I, tired of going through the motions. If we're going to be in the room, we may as well wake up. Eutychus, if you're going to be in the room, why won't you wake up? 
Intention will get you in the room, but attention will keep you in it. And I don't know who this is for. God is getting your attention. I'm telling you that you wouldn't even be in church. Somebody, that's why you're here today. You wouldn't even be in church, but for some reason you came today. It is God getting your attention. Wake up, wake up. You are on the ledge. Get as close to this altar as you can. Get as close to this altar as you can. Come on, press in, press in, press in. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Come on, the worship team is going to lead us. And I just want you to lift up your hands in worship. And I believe we're just going to come through and I'm going to lay hands. I'm going to pray. Our prayer team will pray. If we got to move some of the chairs, we'll move some of the chairs. But I just believe this is somebody's wake-up call. But before anybody prays, come on, I just want you to give him your attention. Your attention. That's what he wants, your attention. Your focus, your focus. I got to wake up. 